Good morning. Today, the topic will be speed and acceleration sensors. So we'll be um, using much of our knowledge from last two weeks where we've discussed position sensors, since speed can be also measured with some kind of position sensors. Uh, I will start with speed sensors with some brief overview uh, what types we can have. So, uh, of course, we can sense speed mechanically. This is done, for example, uh, in um, cars where you sense the speed of the car simply by measuring the speed of the wheels. But we'll not be talking about this at all. So, this is why here it's on the first. Uh, for first uh, line, but it's just in brackets. Uh, we'll be talking about electromagnetic speed sensors because they give us some signal that we can use for control. So uh, we want that the sensor gives us some electrical signal that we can process in a con control system and electromagnetic sensors, they allow us to do that. Uh, we'll be also talking about optoelectric sensors for speed. You will see again uh, a very similar principle as last week for the speed sensors. Uh, I will show you magnetic and inductive sensors. We've been talking about inductive sensors last week, so it will be just a brief, uh, brief, uh, uh, brief uh, repeating of the topic from last week. Uh, we did not cover last week magnetic sensors, so I'll spend a little bit more on speed sensors today. And uh, then we can measure speed with pure optical sensors. And uh, I will show you just one example, which will be the stroboscope. Uh, so let's start with the electromagnetic sensor, which is called a DC taco generator. So a DC taco generator is essentially an electric machine uh, it's a generator that produces a voltage. And uh, the amplitude of this voltage is a function of uh, speed of rotation. So it is something like an electric generator, but we will not use it uh, to create power, but we will use it to simply to create the voltage that we measure. I'll just probably here just to so it you can see the description. So, uh, what are the basic components? Uh, it is a permanent magnet that creates a magnetic flux. So here you have a permanent magnet. It has a south and north pole. Uh, it has a winding here marked with green color. And this winding is rotating in the air gap. The the purpose of the permanent magnet is to create a magnetic flux and uh, when you have a coil, a winding that you move in a magnetic field, then you will have induced voltage. You probably know this from physics. So, uh, the permanent magnet creates a magnetic flux. The magnetic flux goes through this part, which is the stator for magnetic core, and it goes back to the rotor. So if you make a cut somewhere here through the machine, uh, you will see a similar arrangement. So uh, this is the permanent magnet that creates the flux. The flux goes through the air gap, through the ferromagnetic material on the stator, and it's going back to the permanent magnet. And uh, the coil is in the air gap, and when the coil will be moving, uh, we will see induced voltage on this coil. Uh, the ferromagnetic material is there because we want a good conduction of uh, the magnetic flux lines and uh, therefore we need to use iron. So this is from iron and this is from iron and this is the permanent magnet. The air gap needs to be as small as possible because the smaller the air gap, the smaller the magnetic resistance and you have a better properties of the machine. But uh, on the other hand, if you make a really small air gap, then you may have problems with, uh, with building this device. So uh, it is a trade-off between the efficiency of the machine and um, 
the possibility to manufacture that. Uh, the typical air gap is, um, let's say, maximum up to one millimeter, nothing more. So it's very small, but it's still possible to produce it easily without any extra cost. Uh, the materials for permanent magnets, uh, they are typically ferrite materials for tacho generators. But if we would be talking about uh, DC or AC electric machines, then today it would be uh, materials from uh, uh, samarium cobalt or uh, neodymium iron boron, which give you better magnetic properties. Uh, the output is uh, the voltage that is from the coil. And uh, since the coil is rotating, it will be an AC voltage. And I said it's a DC taco generator. So we need something that will convert the AC voltage from the coil to a DC signal at the output. And uh, this device is called a commutator, it's here, and uh, it acts as a mechanical rectifier. Uh, the coil that we have on the rotor is not a single coil, but it has multiple sections, and each section provides you an AC voltage, and the task of the commutator is to switch between the coils that you have on the rotor. So here, uh, you have many coils connected to individual sections of the commutator and uh, the commutator, the coil and the shaft, they are rotating with the same speed like your device where you want to measure. And uh, here we have two brushes that collect the voltage from the coil and sections on the commutator. So the, the brush switches between the individual sections. I have later uh, an image that will explain that in a more detail. So the output of this DC taco generator is DC voltage and the amplitude is proportional to speed. We'll see in a few minutes the equation. Uh, here is how such a DC machine looks like. Uh, this is not a DC taco generator, but it's a, it's a DC motor. But the construction is exactly the same. Uh, there are only details uh, that are different, like materials, for example. Uh, so here uh, you see the winding. Here this is uh, the iron material and the coil is, is uh, uh, connected into slots into this winding. And uh, here this is the commutator. You see this is a copper ring with individual sections. and. Uh, uh, in the case of uh, a DC taco generator, the commutator is typically made, well, covered with silver and uh, the brush is not a brush from carbon, but it's, uh, it's uh, a silver wire. Because for a DC taco generator, we want low losses on the commutator and uh, uh, the silver will give us the low losses. It's more expensive, of course, than copper and carbon. So DC electric machines, they use carbon brushes, typically, and copper commutator. But uh, DC taco generators, they use silver wires and eventually sil silver-coated commutator as well. But otherwise, the construction is exactly the same. Uh, I have here a DC taco generator that you can take a look inside. So this is, this is it. Uh, you can look what's inside. So uh, this is the coil that's rotating and uh, this is the commutator with the silver brushes going this way. And uh, this is the permanent magnet and this is the iron and this is the iron that is used to conduct the magnetic flux. So then you use this device, you connect that through a coupling to a motor and you can measure s its speed, for example. Uh, we'll have... Um, DC taco generators on the labs in uh, in a few weeks, so we'll have a chance again to see that and uh, also to measure some properties. So, so uh, the output is voltage, and this voltage is uh, a function of three things. Uh, it is a function of speed. We want that it's a speed sensor. So uh, the output voltage is a function of angular velocity. Uh, it is a function of magnetic flux. The higher the magnetic flux, the higher the voltage. But this is gi given by the permanent magnet, so it's a constant. 
Uh, the third value this, that I call the CDC here is also a constant and it describes the construction. It uh, hides the size of the air gap. It hides the materials that you use. So basically, uh, the output voltage is a linear function and it's a constant value times angular speed. The DC tackle generator is a voltage source. So it gives you voltage and uh, if you take current from it, there will be a voltage drop on the resistances that are inside of this machine. So uh, if uh, we want to have an ideal characteristic, steady state characteristic of the DC tackle generator, then we need to use a voltmeter that has uh, a high input resistance. It means that uh, the ideal load for a DC tackle generator is going to infinity. Of course, um, we don't have and we can't have instruments that have an infinite, uh, infinite internal resistance, but uh, we can get very close with digital voltmeters uh, and uh, we can get, up, let's say, above 10 mega ohms, at least even higher. So uh, if you use a digital voltmeter for the experiment with the DC tackle generator, that will give you a very nice steady state response. It's very similar as we have covered two weeks ago, uh, the resistive position sensor, this was the same here, uh, it's a voltage source and therefore we need uh, to limit the current that we take from the sensor. So uh, a DC tackle generator is not a power supply, but it's a sensor and you try to limit the power that you take from it. Uh, the output voltage is uh, a rectified AC voltage. So initially it's AC voltage uh, and the commutator will rectify this to a DC voltage. Uh, if you look how the voltage is created, uh, we will see the disadvantages of uh, this approach. Uh, the voltage from an individual section of the coil is AC voltage, so it's a sinusoidal voltage. So let's say this is a sinusoidal voltage from one coil that we have on the rotor. Uh, and the commutator is basically switching between the sections. So uh, at one position we have uh, one voltage from one coil, at another position we have a voltage from another coil, and, the, and so on. So we are switching between multiple coils in time as the rotor is mo moving. Uh, we cannot have uh, an unlimited number of sections on the commutator. So therefore, uh, we are limited in how many coils we can put on the rotor and therefore we are limited also in accuracy. So the commutator is s switching between one, two, third, fourth voltage and so on. And uh, when you look on the output voltage on an oscilloscope, you will see that uh, we have always those peaks that come from the voltage that we have uh, on the commutator. So uh, the voltage V0, so this is a function of the speed so the DC component of this signal will be a function of speed. But there is always uh, an AC component that remains uh, and uh, that's this ripple, delta V. Uh, and uh, if you have more sections on the commutator, it will be smaller. So this basically limits us the accuracy of uh, the DC tackle generator. So the voltage here that depends on the construction of the machine. So uh, the, the DC tackle generator that you have here uh, has uh, 80 volts for 1000 RPM. So if I would measure 1000 RPM, it would give me 80 volts. So V0 would be 80 volts. Uh, on the lab classes, we'll use smaller DC generators that give you roughly two volts for 1000 RPM. Uh, so this is the value of V0. But this value of uh, delta V uh, is again a function of construction and uh, the peak to peak value of this voltage uh, would be roughly few volts for the 80 volts DC tackle generator. So 
the accuracy of the DC tackle generator is typically limited to something about 1% of the measured value. If you want to uh, measure mo more accurately uh, the speed, you need to use a different approach. Uh, the DC tackle generator is a very good machine because it's reliable, it gives you directly voltage, uh, so it does not need any power supply, but uh, it has a limited accuracy. For many applications, it's fine. If you measure the speed with 1%, that's completely OK. Uh, there are applications where you need higher accuracy, so there then you need to use a different sensor. Uh, the steady state characteristic is a linear function. We have seen that in the equation. So uh, if I am increasing speed, then the voltage is increasing. But there is a one problem, and that's uh, with the load resistance. If I use a different voltmeter with a different uh, internal resistance, I will load the output in a different way, and it means I can get a different steady state characteristic. So uh, it is a linear function in both cases, but uh, if it's unloaded, you will get a higher output voltage. In other words, if you use a voltmeter that has a higher input resistance, then you will get higher voltage, like this. If you use a voltmeter, for example, an analog voltmeter, which has a relatively low output resistance, then you will get also a linear response, but you will get a lower voltage. And uh, simply by looking on the characteristic, you cannot tell if it's fine or if it's not. So uh, here, for this kind of sensor, you need to be very careful about the selection of voltmeter that you use for experiments with that. Uh, will you try this on the lab class? You will have um, an experiment where you will measure basically this and this, and you will see that by looking on the characteristic, there can be a huge difference. Here, uh, we will use the 80 volt dynamo, and uh, you will see that this can be, let's say, 50 volts even. So there can be a really huge difference between different types of voltmeters that you use for the reading. Uh, how does it look like? So uh, this is uh, the DC taco generator, uh, similar model that we will use on the lab classes. So through a coupling, you connect the, your device to a shaft. And uh, this is uh, the rotor, and this is the stator of another uh, DC taco generator. So here, again, you see the commutator. There will be brushes in this cover somewhere around here. And uh, this is the magnetic circuit, and the coils are connected, connected here into the slots uh, of the ferromagnetic circuit. So now what properties does it have? Uh, Output is voltage. Uh, typically, it's um, roughly 50 volts, 80 volts for 1000 RPM. So uh, you can find data in data sheets that look like this. Um, let me try to focus it. I'm not sure if it's, well, uh, it's a li little bit better. Uh, so uh, the most important thing is here the rated output voltage, and it's typically specified for some given speed. So for example, this one has 50 volts for 1000 RPM. This one has uh, 200 volts for 4000 RPM. So it also has 50 volts for 1000 RPM. So this is, let's say, roughly an estimate of the output voltage. Uh, the output current that you see here is the maximum current that this device can provide you. So it's related with the load resistance, with the voltmeter that you use. Uh, to measure the voltage, and uh, you see it's a relatively small value, so we can power uh, a voltmeter from that, but we definitely cannot use this as a power supply to power, um, I don't know, a computer, an LED, or whatever device you can imagine. Uh, one important thing is the moment of inertia. It's an, this is an electric machine, so uh, the rotor is relatively heavy, so uh, if you connect it to a device that is 
having a similar size like your sensor, you will uh, you will ha change the moment of inertia of your device. So uh, if you use it for a motor that has 100 kilograms, then it's not a problem at all. But if you use it for something small, then you may influence your instrument. So uh, th it's also one disadvantage of uh, the DC taco generator because it's bulky, it's heavy, um, and it's it can influence quite much the properties of what you measure. Uh, what else? Um, you can see here the weight roughly three kilograms, four kilograms, so it's nothing light. There are definitely uh, some smaller sensors, lightweight sensors, that are good for speed sensing as well. Um, probably linearity, here you can see 0 0.15, 0 0.5, that's the deviation from the linear voltage versus speed dependency. Any questions? Okay, good. So let's go to the optoelectric sensors. This will be just a brief stop because we have already seen exactly the same principle last week. This is a speed sensor, but it can be also used as a position sensor if we modify it a little bit. Uh, the principle is the following. We have a ring with some holes or with some teeth and gaps. And uh, on one side of the ring we have a light source which can be a bulb, can be an infrared LED. And on the other side we have a light detector. This can be uh, a photodiode or a phototransistor. And we are basically sensing if the light is passing through the hole or if it's blocked. It's very easy. Uh, the output of the detector is a square wave signal and uh, if I know how many holes I have on the ring, then I can calculate what is the speed. So it's a very simple device, very reliable. The only problem um, may be here uh, with, uh, with some impurities, with some dirt. So if uh, this light detector uh, gets dirty, then it's not working anymore. So uh, those detectors are good for applications where you don't have these problems. Uh, I have here uh, an example of uh, such sensor. Oh, oh, no, it's, it's not, no, not here. Uh, but I have here a picture at least. This is the sensor itself. So it typically looks like this. So it's a pair of photodiode and uh, a light source, infrared. So it looks like this. So it's covered in black plastic so that it acts like an infrared filter. And uh, one half is a photodiode and one half is typically a phototransistor. And uh, the wheel with the holes is then passing through the slot. So this is the principle that is described on this image. We are detecting if the light is passing through or if it's not. Uh, you can also base this device on reflection. So uh, we have a sensor that projects infrared light and then gets the reflection. And if you have a reflective surface on your uh, on your rotating part, then it will detect the reflection. A typical application, well, we've seen it last week, a computer mouse, or at least the older computer mouses, uh, were working on exactly the same principle. So the ball was transferring the movement on this shaft in this axis and on this shaft on this axis. And here you see this ring here that's exactly the same ring uh, like on the previous picture. So it has holes and teeth. And this is uh, a pair of, uh, this is a phototransistor, and this is an infrared light emitter, infrared LED, and it's detecting if the light is passing through or if it's blocked by the teeth. So when you start that, then uh, you simply 
uh, count the pulses and since you know uh, how many marks you have per one revolution you can calculate the speed and it will uh, tell you wha where you are or, or how fast you are moving. So uh, this is a speed sensor but of course it can be also a position sensor. So if I start from some reference position and th then if I count the pulses uh, I know how how much did I cover in distance. Uh, for position sensor you need that uh, you have a second light source and second detector because you need to distinguish if you're moving left or, and or right. But a speed sensor it's much easier than a position sensor. Okay, third speed sensor, very common one, is uh, an inductive sensor. We've covered um, two weeks ago inductive sensors for position. I've been talking only about LVDTs, uh, but this principle is different uh, and it's very similar to a proximity sensor that we have been talking about last week. So an inductive sensor for speed uh, and uh, in an proximity inductive sensor is basically the same thing. So uh, we again need uh, some ring that will have uh, some ma some marks, some holes and teeth, and we will be detecting if the sensor is s is looking at the teeth or if it's looking at the gap. Uh, since proximity sensors are quite sensitive. Uh, to the correct distance between the sensor and the object, uh, this distance is uh, typically one millimeter. Then if I see the teeth, I will get a different signal than if I'm looking at the gap here. Uh, the ring here needs to be from a firm magnetic material, so it needs to be iron, otherwise it's not working. So it's not working for plastics, for wood, for any other material that's not ferromagnetic. Uh, it can work for conductive materials such as aluminium or copper, but uh, the distance needs to be much smaller. So the best material that you can use for inductive sensors is iron. Uh, inside of the inductive sensor we need a source of uh, magnetic flux. So this is uh, typically a permanent magnet. It uh, does not need to be very strong, so it typically is just a rod of steel that is magnetized with electric current. And we are detecting uh, the changes of magnetic flux. And the magnetic flux is normally around the ferromagnetic core in this way. If I approach the core with some object that is ferromagnetic, I will change the magnetic flux. And since uh, from physics we know that the induced voltage is proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux, it's Faraday's law, then uh, if I change magnetic flux I will see an induced voltage in the coil. So around the permanent magnet we have a pickup coil and we are looking at the signal that is uh, coming from this pickup coil. So this kind of uh, sensor uh, produces its own voltage. It does not require any external power supply. And uh, if we design it well enough, uh, it can uh, provide us the signal directly to a control system. Uh, the voltage uh, is uh, a function of many variables. It is a function of uh, the distance between the sensor and between the and between the 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 teeth. It is a function of the design from the sensor. Uh, and uh, here you see an example of it's, it's a simulation of uh, the magnetic flux inside the sensor. So this is the wheel that is rotating. Uh, this is the sensor. So this is the permanent magnet that is uh, producing the magnetic flux. Uh, those are the magnetic flux lines. And you see is looking at the teeth or if it's looking at the gap. And this will uh, change uh, the voltage that is being produced in uh, the coil and then we can sense that. Uh, this is a simulation uh, with uh, a finite element method. Uh, 
just out of curiosity, uh, the simulation that you see here, uh, it took about three days to calculate. So it's a uh, quite long calculation, but you can do it experimentally as well. Uh, the voltage that you get from the sensor also depends on uh, the ratio between the diameter of the sensor and between the diameter of your of the teeth or of the marks that you have basically so uh, by changing all those properties you can get uh, different voltages you can get different frequencies uh, the typical voltage uh, that you see from the sensor looks like this all well the comments are in check but uh, this is the angle of rotation in degrees and this is the magnetic flux and we see that it's a sinusoidal dependence and this sinusoidal dependence will give us also a sinusoidal voltage that we have on the output. Uh, the voltage actually depends on many variables but uh, typically it's uh, a voltage um, in the range of few volts. So we can connect it directly to a counter and you can, you can measure frequency uh, you can uh, connect that to a circuit that change changes this voltage into a rectangular voltage and then you can count it in, in a computer, for example. Um, applications are uh, typically in the automotive industry. So uh, here you see a typical application uh, that measures the speed of this of this wheel. It's an inactive sensor. It's quite close to the object. The air gap is roughly one millimeter, and uh, uh, the typical use of an inductive sensor is uh, for ABS systems. So it senses the speed of all wheels, and it's saying, "Okay, uh, this wheel is turning faster, or this wheel is blocked, and I need to block it or release the brakes." Uh, so the typical application looks like this: you have uh, the ring with the teeth and gaps and you have the sensor that is in very close proximity to the uh, to the to the object uh, this can be used also as a position sensor if uh, you set a reference so if for example you remove two or three teeth here from this ring then by looking on the signal you will have an AC signal, a sinusoidal voltage and then for some time there will be nothing. And you can say, okay, this is my reference, this is my position zero and I will start counting from this position. This is an example of an automotive inductive sensor. Uh, so this is the source of the magnetic field, so this is the rod of iron that is magnetized. Uh, the coil is wound around this core and then this whole uh, assembly is, uh, is uh, hidden in epoxy so that it's protected against environment. And then you have an output signal which is just the voltage. Uh, the sensor that is based on this principle is uh, very sensitive to the correct setting of the air gap size. Here uh, you can see that in, in this chart. Here you have speed from 0 to, well this is 9000 RPM and uh, this is the voltage that you get from the sensor. Uh, the higher the speed, the higher the voltage, of course, but uh, it will be also quite influenced by the air gap size. So for example this line is uh, where when you have uh, 0 0.5 millimeters air gap and uh, the 100 kilo ohms here it it means the load resistance so uh, it is also sensitive to the way how you measure the voltage that is on this sensor so if i load it with 100 kilo ohms uh, then it will give me a linear dependence and higher voltage. If I use the same air gap and load the sensor more, and you see here, this curve is 0 0.5 millimeters air gap, but 10 kilo ohms resistance on the load. So uh, th it has quite different resistance, and uh, you see it also limits uh, the range where I can use it. 
So if I would use this version, I would say that from this point to this point, it's okay, it's more or less linear. But if I decrease the resistance by selecting a different voltmeter, for example, then here it would be linear in this range, so it limits quite much the range. Uh, also, it is sensitive to the air gap. If you increase the air gap, you will decrease the magnetic flux and this will give you a smaller voltage. So for example, this line is a uh, one millimeter distance for 100 kilo ohms. So this line and this line, they have the same load, but different distance. And uh, this line and this line, they have uh, the same uh, the same ro load resistance but different distance. And you see that the distance varies only by 0 0.5 millimeters, but here you will have uh, roughly one half of the voltage. So it's very sensitive to this uh, setting. Uh, another problem of the inductive sensor is that it is limited to non-zero speeds. If the speed is zero, I don't have any changes in the magnetic flux and therefore I cannot tell if the object is moving or if it's not. So uh, this inductive sensor is good only if you want to detect non-zero speeds. There is always a limit in minimal speed that it can detect. Uh, of course there is also a limit in maximal speed. So here you have um, an example data for this sensor for automotive, uh, maximum frequency 15 kilohertz. It seems a lot, but if you have, uh, for example, 100 teats on, uh, on the ring, then it may give you like something like 1,000, 2,000 RPM. So uh, you need to select the sensor not only uh, on the, the range that the sensor provides, but also on your mechanical arrangement that you have in, in your instrument. Uh, and here you see uh, it is specified for uh, the air gap size of 0 0.8 millimeters plus minus 0 0.3, which means then you need to set it very accurately uh, and you need to adjust the distance so that it is in this, in this range, otherwise it will not work. Okay, another sensor is the whole sensor. Uh, the whole sensor is based on the whole effect, uh, which happens in semiconductors, and uh, it allows us to measure magnetic fields. Um, there's, there's some chalk here. No chalk. Hmm. Oh, so, uh, how does it work? The whole effect happens in a piece of semiconductor material, and uh, we will pass current through this material. So here uh, we have uh, an electrode here and an electrode here. And when this material is not in a magnetic field, uh, the charge is moving basically in straight lines like this. So it's moving from this electrode to this electrode. If I place now the sensor into a magnetic field with some magnetic flux density B, for example, uh, the charge is from electrons and we have a charged particle that is now placed in a magnetic field. And this particle is moving. So there will be a force that is created on this charge and therefore the uh, direction of movement of the electrons will change. So here uh, we will have a different path for the electrons and if now I measure a voltage on electrodes that are perpendicular to the movement of the current, I will have a larger charge here and smaller charge over there. So I will be able to measure the voltage. Uh, the voltage is proportional to the strength of a magnetic field. So the whole sensor can be used to measure 
strength of magnetic field and we will use it uh, as a speed sensor. Uh, we will need a source of uh, magnetic field, so in this case it's a permanent magnet and here we have the whole sensor. Uh, the ring over there uh, needs to have the same properties like for the inductive sensor. It needs to be ferromagnetic because I need that this flux is changing if I see the teeth or if I see the gap. So uh, I need that this ring is ferromagnetic because otherwise it will not influence the magnetic field. So again, here uh, the material needs to be iron and uh, it's not working for plastics, it's not working for wood, it's not working for aluminium. So this is one version for a rotary sensor. Other possibility is uh, that I have a whole sensor placed on top of uh, permanent magnets or it could be also a tape that has been magnetized in a given pattern. So this whole sensor is sensing if it looks on the North Pole or on the South Pole. By counting the number of transitions between North and South, I can calculate the speed if I know how far away those uh, changes are, I can uh, calculate also position. So this can be used as a speed sensor or as a position sensor as well. Uh, typically the whole sensor looks like this. It looks exactly the same like inductive sensor from the outside. So we can't really tell what type that is. Uh, it is also sensitive to the distance between the object and between the sensor. And uh, it is used in similar applications like the inductive sensors. So typically automotive industry, uh, it is used also as an end switch. For example, if you want to detect that some machine has moved to its end position, you can use inductive sensors, you can use whole sensors as well. Uh, so those are the automotive sensor examples. Uh, it is um, also limited in maximal frequency, but uh, the whole sensors are not limited in minimal frequency. So uh, it can detect even uh, if the object is standing still. Why? Well, simply because here I'm detecting the magnetic field and the magnetic field is there even if I uh, if this is not moving. So uh, the advantage of whole sensors compared to inductive sensors is that they can work from zero speed. Uh, so we can see it here. So for example, this sensor, uh, you can see it works from zero to 15 kilohertz uh, or from two to 15, two hertz to 15, 15 uh, hertz. Uh, the minimal f speed here may be limited by the electronics that is inside, but it's uh, even to a two hertz. It's quite quite a low speed. Uh, the output is uh, typically voltage or current. So we can see here uh, the supply current, supply voltage. Uh, the output signal is a square wave signal, so you need a counter that counts the pulses per some unit of time and this will give you the speed. Uh, the air gap size uh, has si a similar, uh, similar range like for inductive sensors, so it's again roughly one millimeter. Depends on the sensor construction. You can see here 0 0.5 up to 1.4 millimeters but you typically need to set it also uh, with the same accuracy like uh, for an inductive sensor. Questions? Okay, and the last speed sensor will be a stroboscope. Uh, this is not really a speed sensor, but it's um, a principle that allows us to, uh, to get uh, Hold on, I'll just notice that there's some check. Uh, 
So it's a it's a handheld instrument that uh, will be used to measure speed of some rotating object. Uh, the stroboscope has uh, two major components. Uh, one is a source of light. It's a it's a typically a fluorescent bulb that uh, wh where we can uh, change the frequency uh, of the flashing. So uh, here we cannot use a normal bulb. It is special fluorescent bulb, uh, and uh, we want to change the frequency of it. Uh, and we need also some reflective object that is on the shaft. So typically, uh, it's um, either a sticker, a paper sticker. Uh, it can be, uh, it can be painted on the shaft. And uh, we are looking for the reflection that it we see from uh, the from the shaft. So we are able to change the frequency of flashes. And the point is that if the light here is shining, we see some reflection. If the light is not shining, we don't see the reflection. So here is a shaft. And on the shaft, we place this reflective mark. It's always there, but we see it only if uh, we shine on it. Uh, and the goal is to compare the frequency of flashes with uh, the speed of rotation that we have on the shaft. Uh, we'll start with the case where the frequency of flashes is higher than the speed of rotation. So uh, here, if you see this yellow, then it means the light is on and I see the reflection. So for example, now we have seen a reflection that is over here. Now we have seen a reflection here and now we will see a reflection here. Uh, it means that uh, the flashes are faster than the speed of rotation. So the shaft cannot make an entire revolution. So I see it for example, I see it here, then I will see it sooner, I will see it here, I will see it here. So this is not the correct setting. I will see that the reflective mark is moving in this way, apparently, and uh, that's not what I want. The second case is when the frequency of flashes is smaller than the speed of rotation. So here again, uh, when it's yellow, I see the reflection. So now I have seen the reflection over there. And since the this, this shaft is moving faster, I will now see the reflection over there, over here. Then it will be here and it will be here. So it will appear as the reflection is moving in the same direction as uh, I have uh, on, the on, the, on the shaft, it, the direction of rotation. So that's not what I want either. What I want is that the frequency of flashes is exactly the same like the speed of rotation. So I see the reflection at a single position and the shaft appears to be standing still. So the way you work with the stroboscope is that you adjust the frequency of the flashes and that you are trying to uh, make it still. And when it's still, you read the frequency from of the flashes from the display of the stroboscope. Uh, you will have a stroboscope in the lab uh, in a few weeks when we will be using that for speed measurements. So it seems easy, but there are several problems. One problem is, uh, what happens if the speed of rotation is uh, doubled uh, compared to the frequency of flashes? So uh, the shaft is moving faster, and in my case it's moving twice as fast. So I see one reflection over here, and I see another reflection over there. I know that there should be only a single re reflection. So this means that I did not set correctly 
the frequency here. I have used a double frequency, and therefore I see two reflections. Uh, a similar problem uh, may be, for example, if you have tripled the frequency. So you now see three reflections. I see one over here, one over here, and one over here. That's not a problem. Uh, it's not a huge problem because I know I have put only one reflection on the shaft, but I now I see three. So I know that my frequency is uh, three times uh, is three times well, I, my speed of rotation is three times higher. But here it's not a big problem because you can distinguish that. You can see, okay, I see three. I should have seen one. I have a problem. Uh, what is a problem is when uh, your speed of rotation is smaller than the frequency of flashes. For example, if uh, the speed of rotation is one half of the frequency of flashes, uh, you see the reflection at this position, then the shaft will move two entire revolutions and then you see the reflection again which means you miss one, uh, one revolution and you can't see that because the reflection appears to be standing still at one position but you don't see that it had passed one or two entire revolutions. It's the same also if you would have one fourth or one eighth of uh, the, the frequency. So the correct procedure when you use a stroboscope is to start always from the highest frequency. When you start from the highest frequency, then you may see this. You may see three reflections or uh, you may see two reflections. But now I know, okay, my frequency of flashes is too small and I need to adjust that. If I start from the lower frequency, you will end with this and you will not be able to see that. So with a stroboscope, always start from the highest frequency, from the highest possible uh, on the given range, and then decrease it and try to achieve at least this three reflections or two reflections, and you will see, okay, now I need to adjust the frequency. We'll do more experiments with that on the lab. Questions? Okay, no questions. And the remaining topic for uh, today is acceleration. Acceleration is um, very related to speed because um, it's basically a rate of change of speed. So we can use also speed sensors to detect acceleration if we calculate a derivative but we will have also uh, special sensors that detect directly the acceleration. Uh, acceleration is uh, not measured directly, but we measure uh, the effect of acceleration on some object. So we basically uh, use the Newton's law, which is saying us that a force that acts on some object is proportional to its mass and to the acceleration. So when we have a fixed mass in an object, then uh, we measure the force with some force sensor, for example, and we can calculate what is the acceleration. Uh, there are many types of uh, acceleration, acceleration sensors. Uh, we can measure force or strain, so it, we can have an object uh, and when we move this object it will bend a beam, for example, and we will measure a force or, um, or um, a displacement or we can, measure, uh, we can measure force created on this beam. So this is the case of the force or strain sensors. You can see here piezo-resistive or piezo-electric sensors, that's basically a force sensor that is used for measure acceleration. Uh, we'll be talking only about a single category, which will be a displacement sensor, and I will show you only the capacitive sensor. Well, simply because this is today the most common sensor, 
and uh, you all have it with you. Where? Where do you have uh, a displacement capacity of acceleration sensor? Cell phone, exactly. So uh, even uh, originally the accelerometers that you now have in cell phones were invented for the automotive industry. We now all have them in the cell phones. Uh, in the automotive industry, it was originally invented uh, to fire the airbags. When you crash into something, you have large acceleration, and this is exactly where uh, this was used originally. Uh, there are different ranges of uh, accelerations and uh, vibrations, basically, uh, good for different principles. So the displacement capacitive sensor will be good only for uh, different for some frequencies and for some it will not work uh, and we will need, need to use different sensors so this is just an overview uh, of uh, the ranges where we can use it and different principles uh, as i said we'll be basically talking only about those capacitive sensors and you can see they are good for low frequencies so accelerometers can also be used as vibration sensors, but here you see capacitive sensors are good for frequencies, let's say up to 100 hertz. If you want to measure larger frequencies, then you need to use, for example, quartz sensors. And on the other hand, quartz sensors are good for high frequencies and they are not good for low frequencies. So, how does it work? Uh, it is a basically a capacitive position sensor. So uh, we will have two electrodes that are fixed here and here, and a central electrode that is moving. And this electrode will be connected to a mass, and this mass will move with the acceleration. So the principle is the following. We have this mass, this mass is suspended on a beam and when I apply acceleration in the vertical direction it will do this and it will get closer to a fixed frame. So we basically measure the distance between the mass and between a fixed frame. Uh, the measurement uh, needs to be sensitive and preferably linear so therefore we need this differential arrangement of capacitors. Uh, the electrodes are one electrode on the frame, one electrode is on the mass itself, and we are detecting a very small variations in uh, the distance between this uh, between those two electrodes. So we'll use capacitive sensing since it's very good in sensing very small distances and very small changes, and uh, we will evaluate that. Uh, in a, a differential way, so capacity between this electrode and this electrode and between this electrode and this electrode. So the output is uh, connected in a bridge connection, so this is one capacitor over here, this is one capacitor over here, and the other half of the bridge is not shown here, but it will be two capacitors and will sense the output voltage. So it's an AC bridge and the output is a voltage proportional to the distance. Uh, this is how it looks like. So uh, it's uh, made out of silicon with the same technology like integrated circuits and uh, typically it's called MEMS, microelectromechanical systems. So here you see the set of electrodes look like this. So this electrode and this electrode is the fixed frame and this is the movable electrode and it's moving uh, in, this, in this direction and this is the mass that is used for sensing. Uh, if I move it, uh, for example, downwards, I will uh, decrease the distance of not a single electrode but multiple electrodes because we want to increase the sensitivity. Um, it can look also like this. So here you see this is the central mass 
uh, this is the fixed electrode and this is the fixed electrode and this is the movable electrode. So this is an example of an XY or two axis accelerometer. So those electrodes would sense the movement in this direction. Those electrodes would sense the movement in this direction. You can make it also in a three axis arrangement. So uh, you can have a single or two or three axial accelerometer that you can get in a single chip. Uh, typically it looks like this, maybe three by four millimeters size and uh, it can have uh, an analog output which is typically voltage or it can be a digital bus which gives you directly the, the numbers. Uh, I have here some examples of uh, accelerometers. Some of them are analog accelerometers, some of them are digital. So here in this box you have many accelerometers. Uh, most of them are three axis accelerometers. Here we have an example uh, what you can expect. Uh, so typically something like 1.5 G's to 6 G's you can get uh, up to 20 G's maybe even larger. Uh, the output is uh, either an analog output which is voltage or it's a digital bus. Typically the buses that are used are called I square C that's uh, a two wire bus or an SPI bus which is a three wire bus. You can see the size, uh, that's the, the package description, so th three by five millimeters. And uh, you can see roughly the, the ranges, so 2G, 3G, if you require higher you can have it. Uh, those are accelerometers with analog, imp analog output, uh, so for example this one has one volt for 1G output. So if it would be here uh, on Earth, then it would give me uh, it would give me one volt signal. Um, another application uh, where you may find accelerometers are, for example, computers. If you have uh, a hard drive, then uh, if if you drop it, then it needs to stop itself because uh, it would be it would be damaged. So if I do this, then uh, it stops the hard drive. There's no hard drive in my computer, so I can do that. I have uh, a solid state drive. So, but in rotary drives, you need to uh, you need to stop the movement when it's falling down in order to prevent damage. And this is also where you find accelerometers. So not only cars, but everyday electronics as well. Okay, and the last thing for today would be gyroscopes. Uh, a gyroscope is a device that detects angular motion and it detects uh, changes in uh, angular motion. So it's something like an accelerometer but for rotation. Uh, the gyroscopes I will show you, uh, they are built in a very similar way to the accelerometers uh, and they are using uh, the effects of uh, Coriolis force. Uh, a Coriolis force is a force that is created in a, a rotating object that rotates with some angular velocity. This object has some mass and uh, it's also moving with some given velocity. So imagine that we have an object like this. The object is rotating with a given speed. And when I move it, then I will see the Coriolis force. And the principle behind the uh, gyroscopes is that we will use this Coriolis force in order to change the position of the object. And we will again detect the position of the object with uh, capacitors. So it's again based on capacitive sensing. So in one axis I will need to force some rotation or at least some movement like this and when I then, uh, this is what I want to sense and when I move it then I will see and I will be able to measure the effects of Coriolis force. So this is what you measure 
rotation or acceleration and this is what you need to create in the device. Uh, typically gyroscopes uh, can be obtained also as multiple axis gyroscopes so uh, this is then repeated in three axes so you have uh, one, two, three axial gyroscopes. How does it work? Um, let's see this picture. Uh, we want to sense this rotation. So I need to make an object that's moving uh, in a, a perpendicular direction to this z-axis. So I need a movement that is uh, in the x-axis. So we'll force a movement of two objects like this. And when those objects will be rotated, we will see, uh, let's say, twisting uh, between this object and this will be a function of this rotation. Uh, it works like this. So here uh, we have uh, the two electrodes and uh, when we rotate the electrodes at the same time, uh, we will see a change of uh, distance between the uh, between the electrodes. So basically, uh, you have two sets of electrodes in the gyroscope. You have uh, one set that is here and another set that is there. You force the electrodes to move closer and further away like this. And when you move the entire device, when you rotate that, you will see a difference between this set of electrodes and this set of electrodes. It's simply because uh, the Coriolis force, when you rotate that against this axis, the Coriolis force here goes this way, and here the Coriolis force goes this way. So at the end, uh, it looks like this. Uh, well, well, maybe I'll start with this picture first. Uh, so we again have a set of electrodes that look like this. So it's looking exactly like an accelerometer. Uh, the difference is that we now need to force those electrodes to move closer and further. So uh, we have, uh, we have uh, this area where uh, we have an additional resonator components that m imply this motion. So we see we have one half over here and another half over there. That's the same. But if I rotate the device, I will see the Coriolis force facing down here and the Coriolis force facing up here. So there will be a difference in the distance that I sense from this part and from this part. And this will give me the angular velocity. So uh, the block diagram of a gyroscope uh, has the sensing elements, so the capacitive sensing, uh, which is over here. So this is the position sensor. And this part is uh, the driving part, which implies the motion of the electrodes. When I combine those two information together, when I get rid out of uh, the movement, with a demodulator, I can see the output signal, and the output signal is proportional to the angular velocity. Uh, this is an example of a two-axis accelerometer. So you see here we have this is for one axis x, and this is for z axis. But you can have a single uh, axis gyroscope, or you can have a three-axis gyroscope. Uh, the output signal is typically a voltage as well. So uh, it is um, a voltage that is proportional to how many degrees per second, for example, you are moving. Uh, you can see here the typical values. So uh, 0 0.6 or 0 0.7 millivolts per degree per second. So uh, it's limited in range, of course. Uh, the measurement range is uh, 1,500 degrees per second, so let's say roughly, uh, roughly five revolutions per second. This is just an example uh, of, uh, of some gyroscope. Different types may work in a different way. 
uh, where is it used, while it's used um, in um, inertial measurement units. Uh, and this unit combines a gyroscope, an accelerometer, a pressure sensor, and typically a temperature sensor, and a magnetometer. So um, it's used in aerospace, for example. Uh, it gets you the orientation of the airplane in space. So uh, the tilt, uh, the, the movements uh, can all be uh, obtained from an inertial measurement unit. Uh, I have here two examples. Uh, this is an example of uh, an industrial inertial measurement unit. And this is an example of a, a hobby unit that you can get for a small airplane. But th the components are the same, the, the difference in reliability and price, of course. So uh, one of the chips is a gyroscope, one is an accelerometer, one is a pressure sensor, one is a magnetometer. Uh, so typically the block diagram looks like this. You have all the sensors here, gyroscope, accelerometer, magnetometer, pressure, temperature, and this goes to a controller, and then you have an output uh, as a digital bus or analog bus, and it may control the movement of the airplane. Uh, it may tell you where you, you fly and how you, you do that. Uh, a comparison of those two units. Uh, so the one on the left side is the is the pro version for the industrial use, and the one on the on the right is the the one for the hobby use. Uh, they have similar parameters. You see here accelerometers plus minus 18 g's. This is the magnetometer, so it's basically giving you, you the heading, it's like a compass. Uh, the pressure sensor, we're talking about pressure sensors, I think, next week. Uh, and here you see similar values. So this is the gyroscope, this is the accelerometer. And in, in the case of this unit, uh, the output is a serial line, which you can connect directly to a control system, to a computer. Uh, in case of those sensors, uh, it's typically an I square C bus or analog voltages that you can connect to some controller inputs. And uh, the end, uh, I'll show you a video what's happening inside of uh, an accelerometer. It's a nice explanation. How does an accelerometer work? I think this is one of the coolest features of today's smartphones. It heats up from down. Built into the circuitry is a tiny device that can detect changes in orientation and speed of motion. Now, let me show you uh, what it looks like. stretches you can calculate the force of gravity. You can easily see that through the heat we determine the orientation to the three-dimensional object. Well line with the Z axis perpendicular to gravity. Only the ball on the x-axis spring shows its tension. Turn this on its side so that the Z axis points up and only the accelerometer along the spring on that axis stretches. So how does this phone and this chip measure changes in gravity? Well more complex than a simple ball and spring model. It is the same fundamental element Inside the chip, the engineers have created a mechanical accelerometer out of silicon. It has, of course, a housing that's fixed to the phone, and a cone-like section that can move back and forth. That's the seismic mass equivalent of the ball. The spring in this case is the flexibility of the thin silicon tethering of the housing. 
Okay. Questions? Okay, no questions.